Welcome to Chop and Brew, everybody. I am Chip Walton. Chris Baines. Brian Adams. We are in Brian Adams' basement, pleasantly known as Badass Brewery. And I'm wearing my Brian Adams t shirt. So wrong. So that, wrong. That can only mean one thing. We are doing some tasting notes on a badass Imperial Porter that was aged or conditioned, whatever you want to call it. In this bad boy, the Chop and Brew Badass Barrel. This is a rye whiskey barrel that we got from Woodenville Whiskey Company in Woodenville, Washington. So we're going to tell you the tale of a big Imperial Porter that went into a fairly small barrel. And now it's going into our tummies. Mmm, it's good. It is good. So stick around with us, taste the notes of the most dark and mysterious kind. Chop for chop. Brew for brew. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> No, I don't work on a brew day, right? I never what? work. Boom, so yes, an imperial porter of badass proportions, man. First, the story of the barrel. We kind of all went in and we got this eight gallon rye whiskey barrel from Woodenville Distillery. It was emptied maybe like three or four days before it got sent from Washington to Minnesota. Uh, we weren't ready to brew into it right away, so I just kept it wet with um, about a cup of rye whiskey, just sloshing it around. I was told by the people there, you don't necessarily have to fill it right away but you don't want to wait more than a couple of weeks because it still had enough whiskey inside the wood had we been waiting longer we might have thought about filling it with water or some kind of citric acid solution or something but we had a plan because we were going to brew into this bad boy what did we want we wanted something that could hold up to it right the yep. first time out what's going to happen with a barrel like this uh, it's going to pick up every all that rye whiskey flavor is going to get in there um some oak, some vanilla. This one picked up a little bit of vanilla, but a lot of that rye because it's so fresh. And there's a little bit of rye sitting in the bottom of this bad boy. And you've done nice. rum barrel beers yeah. before, and yeah. was your experience like a couple of Same days thing. and get it out of there? Uh, I I let that one sleep for a while. I probably had it too long, so it picked up a lot of the rum. So I knew this time, gotta check it. Got to check it every couple days. Um, by the third day, I was checking it maybe twice a day just because it was so good. But uh, Chris Payne said, don't let it go longer than three days before you check it. Okay, so I was checking it. So the beer, we wanted something big, we wanted something bold. We went through the options, barley wine, nope. double, something crazy, quad, Belgian. So yeah, I really like Gonzo Imperial Porter from Flying Dog, it's one of my favorite beers of all time. We looked that up, um, our good friend Vaughn, uh, who's now the brewing manager at Arcadia in Kalamazoo, Michigan, said, I got what you guys need. <laughs> and he hooked us up with a homebrew scale recipe of a beer they call Shipwrecked Porter, and it's barrel aged in bourbon barrels. So I can't remember the OG when they make it commercially. I think it's 1085, 1090. Either way, tell us about what we, uh, what this beer was, what went into the beer and the brew day. Let's see, we did a 10 gallon batch. So we had 25 pounds of two row, four pounds of Munich, two pounds of chocolate, crystal 70 was at two pounds, victory, 
pound and a quarter. Black malt was uh, not even a quarter pound. Um, then we used some uh, EKG, Columbus, and some Goldies. What's the North Down? That's the hop too, right? Yeah, what was that? Uh, it's like a English hop. It's kind of a mild, woodier, kind of like a Goldings, but you know, woody, spicy. Mm -hmm. And then we mix it all together with some Ringwood. Ringwood was our yeast, which is mm. the house yeast strain that Arcadia uses and contrary to popular belief as far as number of generations that you can go they claim to have been using the same pitch or the same whatever you want to call it of their ringwood for 800 plus brews wow. they're all open fermentation and that's a story for a whole other thing so anything interesting about the brew day we haven't ever gone back to even look at the video oh, i know um, the three of us we had a great time listening yeah. to some chance to wrap up <laughs> yeah leads me to believe it was an easy brew day because we were doing all kinds of other things. You yeah, were the brewer, how'd it go? It was pretty easy. Um, I don't remember any hiccups. Mm -hmm. um, no, nothing clogged up, nothing backed up. It was, it was pretty good. It was a big um, grain bill. It was, so we didn't quite hit our numbers, but we were close. So, I mean, yeah, yeah it's such, such a big grain bill. Trying to hit that strike um, temp exactly was a little difficult, but we were close, like off one or, one or two. yeast uh, method that we use here. We use one of Chris Payne's mm -hmm. yeast uh, tricks, man. Tell us about that. Basically, we didn't have a starter set up in time, mm -hmm. so we needed to kind of propagate on the fly post or pre-pitching. So we took the smack pack, we poured some of the chilled wort into there, put it on the stir plate, and then let it go for a couple hours. Mm -hmm. And then once it reached Croizen, pitched it. Yeah. So it was basically a delayed yeast pitch. Yeah. We ran yeah. the wort into the fermenters. We got it sanitized. Yep. Likely with foil or airlocks. Mm -hmm. And then you're essentially making a starter on the fly. Yep. yep. The uh, the stir plate helps get the oxygen into the yeast for more growth. So you get growth from that phase, and then you pitch into the beer. You get more growth. So just to ensure you attenuate the small forward beer. Yeah, and it took off pretty quick. How many days did it ferment in primary? <clears throat> Two carboys, the same beer at this point. Uh, I think I went 10 to 12 days. Okay. Yeah. Yep, primary, put it in secondary, mm -hmm. let it sit for about four more days, and it, it, pretty stable, it stabilized pretty well. The gravity, I say, I think it's time. It ended at about what, 10, uh, 10, 20? 20, 10, 27 ish. No, 10 30. Or then up to 10 30. See, that's what his readings. We're going to go into yeah. some analytics a little bit later. That's what's written down, man. Some, somewhere between 10 20 and 10 30. <laughs> yeah. So the idea originally was I was thinking we would brew 10 gallons because this is eight. We would fill this to the top with eight and we'd have those two left over for topping off. Or tasting. I guess we never communicated that. Maybe we started drinking too early on the brew day. Brian filled this just to five gallons. Mm -hmm. So we now have five gallons in the barrel and five gallons in a carboy yep. straight and barrel. So, which in the end I think is cooler because we have much more of this for trying. So, yeah. Way to mess it up. Way to mess it up. Yeah, well, you know, that. that's how I roll at Badass Brewery. But theoretically, depending who you listen to, these should always be topped up. <laughs> and even as they it evaporates or it soaks in, you want to keep topping it up. So that's, again, a story for another episode. So, how many days did our beer sleep? Ooh, three days. Yeah. That's all it took. It was three days. Yeah. Yep. And um, I, 
by the third day, you know, I checked it that morning and came back that evening and checked it and I thought I went too long because it was strong with the, the rye flavor and the, the whiskey and I was like, oh. Literally just a 12 hour difference yeah, from like going like, to work oh, and coming back. Man, I might have gone too long. And uh, uh oh, here comes the dog. Here comes the dog. Um, thought it was too long. I said, oh, well, I got to pull it. Pulled it off and uh, carbonated it. It, it melted a little bit. It's still yeah. a, a, a good, healthy flavor. Not much aroma like before of the, the rye, but it's got a flavor of that, that rye in there. You take another glass, man? Well, I finished my straight one while oh. we were talking. Why are you sweating? I don't know. <laughs> so let's talk about let's talk about the straight beer first. Let's talk right. about the unbarreled Ooh. beer and what you're getting off that. I mean, I, we drank this uh, maybe like a month ago. Oh, it's more than that. At my house, yeah. It was cold. It was still winter. Mm. It was still winter out. It was cold. Yeah. Um, so, for some <laughs> the regular version itself is it's it's a little boozy for sure. Got a little alcohol on it, but it's not hot or solventy. It's just definitely got some of that kick on the on the nose, on the tongue. Instantly, almost kind of in the feeling. Mm -hmm. uh, I got a lot of toasted raisin, kind of like some dark breads, almost like uh, like raisin bread toast. Mm -hmm. And the finish is real. I don't know, it's like that burnt malt flavor. It's not dry, mm -hmm. like you would think it would be from that flavor, but it's it's really. I always go to chalky, but it's not, it's not chalky. How would you explain yeah. that flavor? Um, it's like lightly astringent. Not astringent mm. enough to be an off flavor mm -hmm. or to be difficult to palatize. <laughs> palatize. <laughs> uh, it's earthy, it's malty, like you said. It's a brown, black malt mm -hmm. type of thing. I put somewhat ashy. Maybe that's kind of what you're talking about. Like chalky mm -hmm. is a little too dry and powdery, whereas yeah. ashy is a little more organic and woody still. It does have like a nice fruit character with it, like that special bee you're mentioning, or like that plum mm -hmm. flavor. It's definitely there and it has plenty of malt character to kind of back up those roasted notes. And yeah. So. Is that fruit coming from the ringwood in the Munich or the ringwood period? Is that yeast pretty estery? Yeah, it's got mm -hmm. some fruit character that it's kind of like a peach, but when you mix it with all these other dark crystals and Munich and mm -hmm. black malt. It's gonna take on like a new flavor. Dog about to knock over the camera. Get out of here. Go on. So as a standalone Imperial Porter, what do you think of the straight version? It's definitely not as oomph as yeah. uh, say like Gonzo Imperial Porter in my mind, but I think that's a little bit more of an Americanized. This is a very Englishy profile mm -hmm. from the numbers to the ingredients. Um, but I do like this. It's definitely a big porter. Yeah, and it's very complex. It's a good sipping beer. I can't drink two glasses of this, right. but it's a good sipping beer. So, working at Summit Brewery, Summit Brewing Company as I do, I have access to the lab analysis. Miss Jerry is nice enough to run homebrew fairly frequently through our, uh, our kind of lowest tier of testing, which is from the finished beer, figuring out what the original gravity is, Finishing gravity, alcohol by weight, alcohol by volume, volume, pH, color, BUs. So it's very interesting is according to our lab analysis, this beer started at 18 Plato, which is something like 1072, 1072, 34, mm -hmm. which is lower than we thought based on hydrometers and refractometers. Maybe they need recalibrating. Mm -hmm. But the most interesting point I think is the final gravity of this is 1018 mm -hmm. of the straight one. The yeah. final gravity of the barrel one is 1021. The same thing happens with the alcohol. The straight one is 7.47%. It's almost 10% alcohol by volume on the barrel version. It's Bam! it pulled out that much whiskey i guess in true liquid form yeah. and maybe even like the fumes like do and there wasn't the fumes kind of there wasn't like a puddle in the bottom either so it was it was poured off i mean there wasn't much in there so i don't know how i picked up three percent that's just crazy so let's talk about the has everybody got the the barrel version at this point i don't know that's right it's the two taller glasses chris you, is like why are you taking my beer away for me oh which one do you put your lips on man uh, <laughs> The clean one? So this one, instantly, you get the barrel, you get the booze, <laughs> you get, you the, get the rye whiskey. Mm -hmm. It is literally like 
somebody said, to heck with putting it in a barrel, I'm just gonna dump uh, a quarter gallon of rye whiskey into this beer. <laughs> a little a bit. Nice earthy spice to it. Mm -hmm. And the vanilla. And yeah. I don't know if the final gravity is higher because of the vanillins and the other tannins from the wood. But yeah, all the alcohol that was soaked in the barrel as the <laughs> as the uh, temperature changes, it's pulling the liquid in and out of the barrel, so sucking in liquid that's absorbed in the staves, and then it's as the temperature changes again, it pulls it back out, and it's kind of smoothing out your beer. Mm. You have uh, polyphenols and other, you know, yeast particles; those get kind of filtered out as they get pulled in and out of the barrel, back and forth, so. So it's almost a filtering device. Yeah, that the vanilla makes it smoother, the, mm -hmm. it kind of melds all flavors together. Yeah. It definitely, Vaughn pointed out when, um, you know, at Arcadia, when they make this beer and they do it in their bourbon barrels, he was saying it pretty much like softens the edges, mm -hmm. hides what booze there is, which is ironic because there's more in it. Said it's slightly oxidative. There's a bit of subtle flavor that comes from that exchange of liquids from the slight bit of air that is coming through this porous material of the wood. Yeah, another cool thing that's interesting is the the, the color of the straight one is 90 Levabon. The color of this one is 96. Yeah. So it's pulling in some of that char, mm -hmm. some of that wood. So it's very interesting that the first um, the first use of this barrel bumped up the booze by three percent, and that's only you know half full. I don't yeah. know if that accentuates the pull or if it actually diminishes. If it was fuller, would it have pulled more? Five, six percent. From either of your experience, the second time we use this, how much will that influence? be decreased from the rye whiskey as opposed to just the wood. Well, what I did with the rum barrel, it was a definite decrease in that intense rum, or in this case, the rye. It was definitely decreased, but you got a lot more of the oak and the vanilla. More of that sh uh, came through maybe because there was less rum. Um, but the third time I started adding more rum back into the barrel, just so I could get that back in there. As it's all. In between brews, like it's being held, like that's yep. how you keep it yep. wet. I poured in about half a bottle in there, sloshed it around, and I'm brewed it, poured it out. Because if you never did that, what you're ultimately going to get is just wood influence, and then eventually mm -hmm. everything just dies, right? You've yeah. leached it. Yeah. Yeah, you've pretty much oxidized every flavor compound to mm. something that's not pleasant, and then you're adding that into your beer. Hmm. So, which is one reason why you want to keep it filled and keep it moist, so. Yeah. Words to live just, by. I'll just percolate on that. <laughs> One thing that I forgot to point out, actually, is this barrel actually made a round trip. I forgot, you can look at the back. It was actually made at Black Swan Cooperage, which is in Minnesota. And one thing that's really cool about Black Swan, they don't do just flat face staves. If you were to look down in here, every third or fourth stave has actually got like little honeycomb oh, punches. Wow. So you're getting that much more um, surface area. Yeah. The beauty is a Cooperage in Minnesota made this barrel for a distillery in Washington and now it has made its way back to Minnesota. So that's pretty cool, full circle story. But yeah, those uh, I really think that honeycomb yet to be patented or maybe already patented is definitely hmm. even further punching the rye whiskey into this beer. Minnesota. Minnesota. Don't sleep on us. <laughs> <laughs> Unless it's 40 below. Yeah. <laughs> then go sleep. So yeah, rye whiskey, barrel number 45. Um, Woodenville Distillery, Woodenville Whiskey Company in Washington sells all of their recently emptied barrel. You may have seen it on the AHA website. Go check them out. Um, definitely big props. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't even know what to do with this now. What should we do for batch number two? Do we stay dark and bold or do we break it into like Belgian golden? Ooh, that might be pretty strong for Belgian golden. Yeah, for like Belgian yeast, I would stick with wine barrels. And then for malty beer, stick with spirit barrels. Okay. Otherwise, you have clashing Belgian phenolics, bourbon. Mm -hmm. 
That might be too much of a party. Yeah, it doesn't taste too good. You know, the Ringwood just offered more fruit character, but if you don't want that, you know, a Cal Al works, but don't dry it out to like 1008. Otherwise, you're gonna have a really tannic, mm. kind of bitter beer with, you know, wood particles that you're tasting. So, mm -hmm. get something that leaves enough malt character, or design it in your recipe via your grist to make sure there's enough flavor to hold the barrel. I know, what do you think? Barley wine? Liking that. Session barley wine. Session, Session barley wine. wine. Yeah, so if we're not gonna hold it, you're like saying that. warm water? I mean, if we're not gonna brew right into it, warm water is the best thing to hold it? Yep, you wanna make sure the staves here are still saturated so that when you're ready to use it, you don't have leaking, mm -hmm. you know, beer out of every direction. Orifice. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I don't know when we're gonna brew into this. It's kind of a it's kind of a bummer, man. It's like we have this awesome thing without enough infrastructure and planning to and keep time. it like just going. Yeah. If you do own a barrel, obviously these aren't cheap. Mm -hmm. So do what you can to keep it up so you don't ruin the waste. Investment. Yeah. You get a lot of great flavors from this barrel, so make sure you're uh, getting your money's out of it. Yeah. Guess we, we better brew. It. We gotta brew. I Actually, gotta I, brew. I, I suckered you guys Summer into up. this, so we're, we're gonna brew till about four in the morning now. Yeah, tonight? <laughs> Let's do it. Got some grain <laughs> in the car. Going. Got some grain in the car. Yeah. Got some hops on in the back. Adventure number one with the Chop and Brew Badass Rye Whiskey Barrel. We'll see what adventure number two holds. If you want to check out the recipe, we're going to put the recipe up there. Yep. Vaughn's recipe, which has influenced what we ended up doing. Um, if you have similar awesome experiences with barrels and some tips on how to use them or not use them, let us know everywhere where great episodes of Chop and Brew are found. Website, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, all that good stuff. Big props to the badass Brian Adams and his well, brewery. To Major Pains. Major Pains. All Grains Major Pains. To Brew Your Own Magazine for helping the cause of Chop and Brew spread the word. Mm -hmm. And to the fans, man. Don't forget, chopandbrew.com for all your t shirts and stickers and ringtones. And uh, Brian Adams t shirts. Just kidding. One of the kind right here, baby. One of the kind. Till the next time we drink something out of this barrel. Chop for chop. Brew for brew. Brew for brew. brew, for brew. brew, for brew. Jameson, how you doing? Up, little brewer. Good. Good. Coming in the picture. Careful, don't knock it over. Don't knock it over, boy. Just a mini brewer right here. Say hi, buddy. What's up, Jameson? Hi. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Tastes pretty good. Shut <laughs> done. Hey, we're, we go. we're dressing a set, y'all. Is that better? Yeah. You got room over there for Chipper Rooney? Well, let me work the side you're on just so I can like keep an eye on that. Sorry, man. I know, man. You ain't working me for me. I'm bossy. I'm bossy. Now that I'm making millions. Millions. <laughs> What's that written down on my head? I can't even make it's hundreds. Shot. What it's like <laughs> living a brownie. Do you remember the Vanilla Ice song? No. <laughs> Man, no. <laughs> You're like, wrong, He's wrong, like, motherfucker. Wrong. 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 It's full, right? Get a picture of that. Hell yeah, it's full, man. <laughs> I don't mess around. Beefcake. Am I babbling? Nope. You're good. Sweet shit. Babbling on. <laughs> You guys ready? <laughs> ready? Yeah. Woo! Bottoms up. Beef cake. <laughs> <laughs>